In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. My brothers and sisters, as we come to the altar of God, as we worship God from the altar of our hearts at home, we acknowledge our sins, our need of God's grace and mercy and guidance in our lives, and we prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, graciously keep from us all adversity so that unhindered in mind and body alike, we may pursue in freedom of heart the things that are yours. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. Resplendent and unfading is wisdom, and she is readily perceived by those who love her and found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known in anticipation of their desire. Whoever watches for her at dawn shall not be disappointed, for he shall find her sitting by his gate. For taking thought of wisdom is the perfection of prudence, and whoever for her sake keeps vigil shall quickly be free from care, because she makes her own rounds, seeking those worthy of her, and graciously appears to them in the ways and meets them with all solicitude. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, about those who have fallen asleep, that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose, so too will God, through Jesus, bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Indeed, we tell you this on the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, with the word of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, will come down from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, console one another with these words. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them. But the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, there was a cry, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, for there may not be enough for us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. While they went off to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other virgins came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore stay awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. We have several names for it. Desire, will, passion, drive, whatever we call it, the desire for something is all important. If we don't desire a particular something, then we're probably not going to get it. Or if we don't desire it strongly enough, we might risk missing it or losing it, whatever it is. When we hear the parable of the ten virgins here, we often interpret the oil uh, in the lamps to symbolize faith or alertness, and that certainly is, is correct. But there's another possibility as well. Maybe the oil represents their desire for the bridegroom. Half of them maintained the desire for God, even as they fell asleep. But the others, well, they had the desire, and then as the bridegroom was delayed and delayed, they just lost the desire. They lost the drive to be with him. And since they lost the desire for the bridegroom, they also lost the bridegroom himself. Or listen to the words today from the Book of Wisdom. Wisdom, as we heard, wisdom is readily perceived by those who love her and found by those who seek her. She makes herself known in anticipation of their desire. 
love and a passion for something necessarily come before uh, perceiving that thing. Seeking, searching come before finding. Desiring, straining to see, they come before seeing and knowing. If we're desiring God, then God can reveal himself to us. Uh, If it is our will to find divine wisdom, then wisdom will be found. It's all very simple and, and logical. If we desire something, we'll probably find it. If we will something to happen, then it probably will happen. But if not, well, then nothing happens. This might be too much of a generalization, but perhaps we can say that everything which happens happens because someone willed it to happen. Our will, our desire shapes the world. And so it's a critical force, our will and desires, critical force uh, to pay attention to. God and his Holy Spirit are like the engine in a vehicle. You know, it could be any vehicle, car, boat, train, ship, whatever you like. God is like the engine making it go. But our will, our desire, is like the rudder or the steering wheel or like uh, the gear shift. And this is so important to keep in mind because as much as God is God and God is God running the show, he put us and our will behind the steering wheel. And so we better have our will, our desires, in good order, or we're going to have a rough ride, not only individually, but as a society as well. What we're witnessing right now with our election is, among other things, a battle of wills. What we've been seeing the past few years, and even for years before that, has been a battle of wills. Again, think of a car going down the road and the car is the country. Well, we elect a president to steer the car. Uh, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter who it is. We elect a president along with Congress to steer the car. But what happens when you have, say, a backseat driver who decides to climb over into the front seat? Well, the the ride gets a little bumpy. Passengers get thrown all over the place. Hopefully, the car doesn't crash. It's a battle of wills over who's steering the car. And as we know, there are some very powerful wills at work uh, amongst our politicians. So it's a more than usual bumpy ride. But you know, the conflict between these wills is not really the issue. Actually, we thrive on having uh, different uh, points of view on things. We thrive on having checks and balances in place. We thrive on debate and discussion. The conflict of wills is not actually the issue. What's at issue, and what seems to have stymied us right now in in the election, is the polarization of these wills, and especially the vigor that is behind behind that polarization. These wills are to the point of being practically incompatible, like oil and water. And so into this dynamic of, of clashing wills should enter the conscience, and its close cousin, reason. Conscience and reason are maybe like dish soap. They cut through the grease and the grime. They break down the barriers between oil and water, and they get things flowing again. Conscience calms down the will and our desires. The thing about conscience, though, is that you have to have a good amount of it, especially when when wills and desires are running loose. How many of our politicians have a healthy conscience? Well, I don't know. That's a question. We know they have strong wills, but do they have strong consciences? Are they level-headed enough to let conscience and reason keep their wills and their drives in check? Now, of course, I wouldn't be asking the question if I didn't think the answer was at least a little bit, no. Now, some do, and thanks be to God for those men and women, because they keep the others in check. But what happens when the will and the drive of some politicians is so strong and their conscience is so underdeveloped that they're difficult, if not impossible, to rein in? What happens then? 
Well, as we know, a mess happens. Uh, division, animosity, angst, uh, the threat of tyranny, which is an entire country subjected to the uncontrollable will of some. And then we cease to be a republic, and, when, and at best we become an aristocracy with a ruling class and then the rest of us who are being ruled. The conflict of wills in this election is not the issue. The issue is the intensity behind these wills and the apparent, the apparent lack of desire in some to reign in their wills and to foster a healthy conscience. There's too much of this is what I want and I don't care if it's right or wrong. And there's not enough of this is what I want. But this other thing, this other option is also viable. There's not enough conscience and reason. And so what do we do? You know, we followers of Christ, faced with apparent injustices and and problems here, what do we do? Well, among other things, we ourselves remain strong in will, and especially, and even stronger in conscience and reason doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat or independent, conservative or liberal. Remaining strong in will and being even stronger in conscience and reason is a good thing for everybody. For some people, you know, uh, that might lead them to getting more, to be more actively involved in at least local politics. Maybe some of us would run for local public office, bringing our Catholic conscience and reason with us. Who knows? Uh, you know, doing that would actually reflect, reflect one of the roles of the church in society. To hold politicians and leaders to a higher moral and ethical standard for the good of all. Another thing we all can do is to intercede with God for our politicians and fellow citizens who perhaps don't have the strongest of consciences. Specifically, we pray that they get a conscience. We pray that God would miraculously give them a sense of right and wrong and that they might be repentant and and confess their offenses against others, uh, not only to God, but to their fellow citizens and to the government. We pray that they would have a stronger desire to have a healthy conscience, that they would be brave and do what is right and just. We have arrived at a point of lack of trust in the system. And that's due in large part to overzealous political wills who aren't controlled enough by a sense of conscience and who apparently don't even desire that conscience. It isn't about who wins. It's about the integrity of the election process and the dire need, the dire need for that sacred institution to be guided by healthy consciences. You know, with an upright and honest election, everybody can accept the results and be at peace with that, regardless of the outcome, if it's upright and honest. But when the political conscience is impaired, well, who knows what to think? Our will, our desires, our passions, our drives uh, is essential to our flourishing as humans. But just as essential is our desire to be ruled by our conscience and by reason. Without that specific desire, we're not much more than animals with suits and ties, living the jungle law of kill or be killed. And you know, God has made all people, including politicians, to be far better than that. God continually calls us, calls us, his faithful people, to be strong-willed and strong in conscience. And you know, we confirm our commitment to that whenever we profess our creed, and accept all the implications that come with the creed. We confirm that commitment when we say amen to Christ in the Eucharist, when we say amen to letting my will and and desires exist in cooperation with God's will and desires. And we confirm our commitment to being strong-willed and strong in conscience through our receiving of God's grace in all the sacraments, especially the sacrament of confirmation, which we're celebrating this weekend with some of our high schoolers. As you just heard, the confirmandi 
uh, the confirmandi stand up and they say, I wish to be confirmed. I wish, I desire, I will that my life should be bound up with God and with everything that is right and just. I will that my life should be bound up with everything that is true and honorable, everything that is good and beautiful. I will, I desire this. And those are strong words of commitment. They're also tremendous words of hope. These youth stand before God, before the minister, before the church, and with all sincerity, they profess their refusal to be agents of malice, their refusal to be agents of dishonor, their refusal to be agents of corruption in the world. Confirmation is a sign of hope for the world. We should each remember our own confirmation and what was said and desired. We profess, these confirmandi profess and the desire that God's kingdom would come and that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that all people and especially every politician would themselves desire such goodness and uprightness for a well-ordered and civil society. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us, men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And once again, we offer our prayers, our needs, and the needs of our world to the Lord. We pray for all the faithful in all walks of life, that God would inspire us toward both strong desires and a healthy conscience. Let us pray to the Lord. For our political leaders in the United States, that God would bless them with humility, conscientiousness, and a thirst for uprightness. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who suffer with depression, anxiety, and loneliness, and for those who struggle financially, spiritually, or physically because of the pandemic, let us pray to the Lord. For our parish community, that we would hold those being confirmed accountable to both the demands and the joys of Catholic living in Christ, let us pray to the Lord. For our brothers and sisters being confirmed, that God and his angels would keep watch over their minds and hearts, especially in times of temptation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the monthly intentions of Pope Francis and Bishop Ricken, for the prayers written in our parish books of prayer, and for the prayers we offer to the Lord now from the altar of our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. And for the family and the friends of St. Clair Parish, for whom this Mass is offered, 
And for all those who have fallen asleep in Christ, may they awaken to the glory of heaven. Let us pray to the Lord. God, our Heavenly Father, we bring these prayers before you. We lay them before you with faith and hope in your providence and kindness and mercy. We ask you to receive them and, as always, to answer them as you will, through Christ our Lord. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness, we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Look with favor, we pray, O Lord, upon the sacrificial gifts offered here, that celebrating in mystery the passion of your Son, we may honor it with loving devotion, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For when your children were scattered afar by sin, through the blood of your Son and the power of the Spirit, you gathered them again to yourself that a people formed as one by the unity of the Trinity made the body of Christ in the temple of the Holy Spirit, might to the praise of your manifold wisdom be manifest as the church. And so in company with the choirs of angels, we praise you and with joy we proclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, And once more, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, 
Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and to minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and David, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And behold, the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Nourished by this sacred gift, O Lord, we give you thanks and beseech your mercy that by the pouring forth of your spirit, the grace of integrity may endure in those your heavenly power has entered. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life.